today is Wednesday lunch here at the Divinity School. I am Karen Wine, I'm the Director of Communications here and I've organized this series, so it's lovely to see so many of you here today. Okay? <laughs> Before we get started, I want to do our usual housekeeping. I want to thank our crew and our chefs for today's meal. This was made from scratch by right here in our kitchen. So we do ask that you clean up after yourselves on your way out. Um, are these like compost? Yes. Are they compost or garbage? Garbage, compost, recycling. But are the plates compost? Uh, yes, they're about degradable. Yes. So your plates and your leftovers can go into the compost, and any any trash into the trash, and your silverware into our yellow soapy vat. I'm just saying, all the back there. We appreciate that a lot. Are there any community announcements tonight? Workshops. Things we need to know. No? You know it's nothing. Oh, yes. Oh, Wednesday lunch is still hiring, so if you're interested in helping us cook this delicious food, it's a lot of fun. You get paid. Um, just email the Divinity Lunch on email. You do not have to be a Divinity School student to work for lunch. You do get free food. More of this food. Anyone else? No? Okay. Um, before I introduce today's guests, let me also ask you to turn off your cell phones. So rude when they go off. I'm really delighted to be able to introduce our guest for today. Our guest is Vu Tran. He's a professor in the Department of Creative Writing here in the Department of English. His fiction has appeared in the O'Henry Prize Stories, the Best American Mystery Stories, A Best Defense, Southern Review, Harvard Review, and other publications. He's received honors from Glimmer Train Stories and the Michigan Quarterly Review. And he was a recipient in 2009 of the Whitey Writers Award, and in 2011, he was a finalist for the Vilchuk Prize for Creative Commons. His first novel, uh, with the library binding, um, <laughs> oh, I wish you brought that up. Oh, yeah. The right, the, well, this is the library binding. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a different cover if you go into it. <laughs> it's Dragonfish, and this was just published in August 2015 from Norton. Professor Tran was born in Vietnam. He was raised in Oklahoma. He received his MFA from the Iowa Writers Workshop and his PhD from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And he is going to read to us today from Dragonfish. We'll have time for QA. I think you're really going to like it. It's going to be really awesome. So please join me in welcoming. Thank you so much for, uh, for having me. I know how, uh, how wonderfully traditional these, uh, these lunches are, so it's really uh, a great treat for me to be here. And uh, thank you for, for those who made the lunch. It was really, really delicious. It really was. Um, I, uh, I'm going to read uh, from my novel, uh, but I'd like to talk uh, just about five minutes or so, uh, a little bit about it, and, and I don't know, some of my uh, the ideas I was uh, playing around with uh, when I was writing. Um, it's um, I've been doing a lot of uh, interviews and, and, and readings since it came out in August, and the question I, I almost always get is why I chose to write an immigrant novel in the guise of a, of a crime novel or a noir novel, whatever you want to call it. Um, and to very briefly describe the novel itself, um, it's the story about a, a white American police officer uh, from Oakland, a man named Robert who had a tumultuous marriage to a Vietnamese woman whom he named Susie after his first girlfriend. Um, she left him two years before the novel begins and has moved to Las Vegas and apparently remarried uh, a Vietnamese man, a gambler, um, who also happens to be a smuggler and a rather unsavory guy um, and an abusive husband. And the thrust of the plot is that as the novel begins, um, Susie has uh, disappeared, as uh, women are uh, uh, often do in crime novels, <laughs> um, and uh, and has left this this new Vietnamese husband, intentionally or unintentionally, and so he has blackmailed Robert into finding her for him in Las Vegas. Now, uh, what I just described is the crime narrative of the novel. It takes up about two thirds of the book. There is a, a secondary narrative. Uh, which I'll be reading from today, uh, that is made up of letters uh, that this Vietnamese woman, uh, Susie, is writing to her daughter, 
uh, whom no one knows about uh, and whom she abandoned uh, 20 years before uh, when they first came to the U.S. And these letters detail their escape from Vietnam by boat, uh, their life on a refugee island off the coast of Malaysia, and how that life intersect, intersected, in fact, with this, this Vietnamese man uh, who is now Susie's husband. Um, now, the, the reason I ended up merging this immigrant narrative with a crime narrative was really accidental. I was asked to contribute a, a short story to an anthology of crime fiction about Las Vegas, and my job was to write about Chinatown. Um, and, and once I started turning the story into a novel, um, I realized some interesting connections between uh, the noir genre and uh, particularly the Asian diaspora. Um, first of all, as the word suggests, noir is about uh, the absence of life, the absence of truth. And um, it's about the stories that exist in the shadows and only are only partially revealed uh, to us. And of course, the endless and endlessly unanswerable questions that come out of that. Um, if you've read a lot of noir crime detective fiction, whatever you want to call it, uh, whether it's Arthur Conan Doyle or Raymond Chandler or, or the kind of crime novels you see now in, in airport bookstores, um, you might see a lineage that goes back to the American and English uh, romantic movement, to, uh, for example, the Gothic novel, uh, the Gothic narratives of Edgar Allan Poe, uh, Mary Shelley, uh, to even poets like Samuel Taylor Coleridge and Lord Byron. Um, and a figure like the Byronic hero, for example, uh, which is this, usually this brooding loner who roams the land, uh, fighting his enemies by himself, uh, hiding great misery in his heart, um, is full of cynicism and vengeful anger, and yet also capable of deep affection. And um, this figure is very similar uh, to the detective to the anti-hero, um, uh, basically to the kind of hero of crime novels that we're used to today. Um, and one of the reasons this figure is has always been compelling to readers is because he is uh, shrouded in mystery uh, and appears way down, uh, fundamentally affected, and, and therefore shaped by the stories in his past that he is unwilling uh, to tell others or perhaps is unable to tell them. Uh, and of course, traditionally, this figure is, is often male. It's rarely a female figure. Okay. Um, and the thing is that this reminds me a lot of uh, the immigrant, uh, at least in my, in my mind, um, of the refugee, of the displaced person in an alien land whose only real possession is his or her memory of the homeland, uh, of the life and identity they were forced to leave behind, perhaps permanently. Um, and of course, there is a big difference between the immigrant and the refugee, because the latter was private agency. Uh, and, and that absence of power uh, and choice inevitably brings with it an absence of trust and meaning. Right? Uh, and while some refugees, of course, are more than willing, uh, like myself, I was a refugee, um, uh, and I went through some of the, uh, the things that these characters do. Uh, some refugees are more than willing to share their stories with people, um, but there are many who refuse to, uh, who cannot even do it if they wanted to. And so I was always interested in the reasons why refugees do not tell the stories that they end up carrying around, excuse me, that they carry around their entire lives in the new country. So I... I think that ambiguity, was those reasons that are known and unknown, even to the people who carry those hidden stories, um, was always the engine for, for this book. And if that ambiguity is ultimately meaningful, uh, uh, that meaningfulness, I think, comes out of that space between what is concealed uh, or denied and, and what is unavoidably uncertain and undefined, right? Uh, and if we are to harken back to the romantics, I'd add that this space is, is marked by apprehension, uh, perhaps even trauma and horror, and in that sense, moves towards the sublime in that way. Um, 
And, and on a more por uh, personal note, um, I also get this question a lot, uh, is what book shaped me the most when I was a child? And the one that I always did, um, uh, well, first of all, I, I should say that there's a, an Englishman named Christopher Book who wrote this book called The Five Basic Plots. Oh, I'm sorry, The Seven Basic Plots. And one of them is, uh, he calls The Voyage and Return, which is, and we all know this one, it's when a character leaves their normal world and enters an alien world and then returns after what usually amounts to a thrilling escape. And if you've read Alice in Wonderland or um, uh, uh, War of the Worlds or, or you know, you've seen the movie Planet of the Apes, that's that kind of narrative, that kind of plot. And, and when I was a child, the book that that I loved the most was The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. This is before I, I, I knew it was a Catholic allegory. <laughs> I had no idea how long was Jesus. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I loved that book, and I, I read that series and, and loved all of it. But I found myself, because I've been writing since the first grade, and I found myself always returning to that plot without even knowing it, which is, again, having my characters enter into an alien world. Um, and it was only a few years ago that I realized that I'd always been writing the immigrant narrative. Because that's basically the immigrant narrative, too. Um, but the question that I ask now is, when a character enters that alien world, uh, is it actually a world that they want to stay in? Or is, it, or is it the home? Is it home, the normal world that they long for? And, and that's a question I never thought about too much, especially in the context of, um, of being an immigrant. Right. So, um, so what I'm I'm, uh, I'm going to read to you uh, the first two pages of the novel, and then I'm going to skip ahead a bit. Uh, thank you again for coming. Um, our first night at sea, you cried for your father. You buried your face in my lap and clenched the fist to your ear, as if to shut out my voice. I remind you that we had to leave home, and you could not make the trip with us. You would catch up with us soon. But you kept shaking your head. I couldn't tell if I was failing to comfort you if you were already, at four years old, refusing to believe in lies. You turned away from me, so alone in your distress that I no longer wanted to console you. I had never been able to anyway. Only he could soothe you. But why was I, even now, not enough? Did you imagine that I, too, would die without him? Eventually, you drifted off to sleep along with everyone around us. People were lying side by side, draped across each other's legs, sitting and leaning against what they could. In the next nine days, there would be thirst and hunger, sickness, death. But that first night, we had last made it out to sea, all 90 of us. And as our boat bobbed along the waves, everyone slept soundly. I sat awake just beneath the gunwale with the sea spraying the crown of my head. And I listened to the boat's engine sputtering us towards Malaysia and farther and farther away from home. It was the sound of us leaving everything behind. The truth was that I, too, thought only of your father. On the morning we left, I held you in the darkness before dawn and lingered with him as others called for us in the doorway. He kissed your forehead as you slept on my shoulder. Then he looked at me, placed his hand briefly on my arm before passing it over his shaven head. I could see the sickness in his face, the uncertainty, too, clouding his always calm demeanor. He had already said goodbye in his thoughts and did not know now how to say it again in person. I did not want to go, but he had forced me. For her, he said, and looked at you one last time. But then he pushed me out the door. If you ever read this, you should know that everything I write is necessary to explain what I later did. You are a woman now, and you will understand that I write this not as your mother, but as a woman too. On that first night, as I watched your chest rise and fall with the sea, I wished you away. I prayed to God that I might fall asleep, and that when I awoke, you would be gone. So, uh, that's the first two pages of the novel, and then it, 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 it goes into the crime narrative. So, I'm going to skip ahead to page uh, 85, uh, and everything I skipped is really, really good. <laughs> I don't have time to read uh, this, is, this is actually going to be a continuation of those, uh, of those first two pages. Um, and if you're wondering, well, this doesn't sound at all like a crime novel. Um, uh, 
you know, the crime, if you can define it as a crime, uh, kind of takes place during these letters, during the time of these letters. On our second night at sea, you disappeared. I awoke and found your shorts by my side and had to keep from screaming your name. Where could you have gone with all the sleeping bodies around us? I'd seen a few mothers tie string from their wrists to their child's wrist, and I cursed myself for my laziness. Then I saw you, and it was like seeing a ghost. You were outside the boat, looking in, calmly holding on to the gunwale as though you were ready to let go, as though you were levitating. I grabbed your arms and hauled you back inside. You were naked from the waist down. I looked over the gunwale and realized that you had been squatting over the sea, balanced on some wooden trim along the side of the boat, all to avoid the boat's latrine, which apparently frightened you more than falling into the sea. You flinched when I touched your cheek. I must have been glaring at you as if I was ready to spank you, but my heart was pounding. If you had fallen overboard, no one would have known, could have known. The night would have swallowed you whole. Your presence now seemed such a miracle that I was overcome with shame at having ever wished you away. I loved you more in that moment than at any other moment in your life. I cradled your head, smoothed your brow, and wondered what had possessed me those last few days. Don't ever do that again, I told you, but I was saying it to myself. I held you fast until you slept and did not close my eyes until images of your death faded into the night. There are things that people do poorly for lack of talent, and things they do poorly for lack of desire. Then there are those things that all the desire and talent in the world cannot make possible, cannot make fit, no matter how often you pray and how hard you pretend. On the day you were born, I lost my voice. Words came out like gas, and during labor, my pain had no sound. The nurse held my hand. Your father had been gone for five months, vanished without a word, and no one knew if he had fled the country or been in prison or if he was even alive. You must have sensed it. A baby's cries at birth are full of vigor, but yours were weak and willful, a stubborn crying, as though you were already disappointed in me and mourning him. When I held you for the first time and refused to nurse, you struggled in my arms and kept crying softly. Even when my voice came back, I found I had nothing to say. I remember a deep, instant love for you that felt like a locked room inside me. It's only now as I write this, as I say these words to myself, that I begin to understand it. I wonder what you remember of our fifth night, when that strange tragedy began. It was a moonless night, the darkest so far of our trip. A woman began wailing and awoke the entire boat. Where is my son? She shrieked. My son is gone. The engine stopped and lanterns were lit. People were already looking overboard. Although a few men stood ready to jump into the sea, we all knew there was no sense in it. We had only just stopped the boat, and the calm black waters around us showed no sign of anything. If the boy had fallen in, it was already too late. People were consoling the mother, restraining her. Like me, she had no one else on the boat but her child. I remember him. He spent most of the first day rushing into a plastic bag as she stroked his hair and patted his back. The yellow stains on his t-shirt were still visible the last time I saw him. He was your age, your height, thin and sickly, and his disappearance cruelly echoed what might have happened to you three nights before. What I had miraculously avoided, this woman was now suffering. People searched every corner of the boat. There was no trace of the boy. The captain finally restarted the engine, which got the woman screaming again. No, no, you can't leave him behind. I must find him first. Somehow you would remain asleep throughout, throughout all of this. But now you were wide awake and clutching my shirt. Why is she screaming? You asked me. I had no idea what to say and could only turn you away and cover your ears. But you peeled off my hands and repeated your question until I finally snapped at you. Even as the shadows obscured her, you kept staring. She wept for hours. We could hear her over the boat's engine, moaning in the darkness. No one could comfort her, and no one could sleep, not even you. As her fits turned hysterical, my pity for her was replaced with something like hatred. At one point, I even considered quieting her by force, but at dawn, she suddenly stopped, exhausted apparently, and people at last were able to fall asleep. 
It rained late that morning. Everyone's mood improved. We collected rainwater in as many containers as we could find, and the storm was cool and soothing after days of scorching weather. I watched you sit nearby with two older kids. It surprised me since you rarely played with other children, or with anyone for that matter. But then you went still as you faced the stern of the boat. I figured you had grown bored, as you often did in the company of others. You were drenched in the rain, your hair matted on your forehead, your eyes salty. Someone screamed. By the time I turned around, I caught only a flash of the woman's head <laughs> and arms disappearing overboard in the haze of rain. You must have seen everything, her climbing onto the gunwale and standing there for a heartbeat, for one final breath before leaping into the sea. Two men dove in after her. The boat again was stopped. The storm had gotten worse, and it took some effort just to get the two men back on board. Neither had seen or laid a finger on anything. The boat was quiet for hours, save the sound of the engine and the old women reciting their rosaries. I prayed alongside them, but only for the boy. I remember the minutes after it happened, when people peered overboard and waited breathlessly for the swimmers to come back up with the woman's body. And all I could think was how melodramatic it was, how cowardly. She had no right giving up, to come all this way and then to do that. It turned out, of course, that she died for nothing. Hours later, someone below decks lifted the tarp that covered the fuel store and found the boy wedged between the 20-gallon cans, lying in a pile of filthy, gasoline-soaked rags. He had a burning fever and could barely move or make a sound. Who knows why he had wandered down into the hole that night, or how he'd even gotten there, weak as he was. He must have passed out beneath the tarp, hidden from people lying arms linked from him, and deaf to his mother waiting his name for hours. He was carried above deck where two older women forced water down his throat, cooled his forehead with a damp rag, and rubbed hot oil over his chest. I prayed for his recovery, yet dreaded it. What would we say when he was strong enough to ask for his mother? He ended up surviving the boat trip somehow, despite hardly moving for the final four days. Once we made it to the camp, he disappeared onto the floating hospital, that white ship moored off the island shore. And we heard three months later that he recovered and was sponsored by his uncle in Australia. He'd be a grown man now, with children of his own and stories about his childhood that he might not be able or willing to tell. He's probably forgotten what his mother looked like. I still remember, more than I want to, her writhing in the arms of a consoler, tearing at her white blouse until a neckline ripped, her long, equine face crumpled behind the tangles of her hair, mouth ajar, and eyes clenched shut, that howling mask. She must have felt she lost everything when she thought her son was gone. Until then, she had only lived for him. <clears throat> what was she now to herself or to the world if she was no longer a mother to anyone? It was shame that welled inside me after they found the boy that day. I imagined myself losing you and realized that I could not have done what she had done. I would have mourned you for the rest of my life. There is no doubt. But your death would not have been back then the death of anything, anything inside me. Thank you. So I'd be, be more than happy to discuss uh, anything that you're curious about, whether it's about the book or uh, or myself. You don't know me, so I don't know why you'd be interested. <laughs> yes. When I, I read it, quite a few mysteries, but I always read the end first. I want to know. I want to know how it's going to end up. Why is that? Just oh, there's enough. There's enough surprises in life. I'm, I'm reading it for entertainment. I just want to see. Oh, don't tell us. <laughs> don't tell us. Why okay, so the last page. <laughs> Do you ever write knowing how it's going to end? You know, I used to. And I used to think that I always had to. Because how else? It would be something to write towards. Yeah. So when I was writing short stories, I would always have some kind of ending in mind and a kind of skeletal plot. Uh, mapped out in my head um, and then it might not end up in that direction but at least I'd have a direction that I would be going towards 
And it was very weird writing a novel. You, I, I thought writing a novel, because, you know, a novel is so many more words, <laughs> that I would really need to know the ending, or that I would need to know the structures of the plot beforehand. And I found myself, every time I, I, I thought ahead too much and planned ahead too much, I would slow down in my writing. Uh, and I actually didn't know the ending until the last week before I, I turned it into my editor. Um, and, um, and I don't know if, if I'll continue to write like that, but I found myself writing sentence by sentence, scene by scene. And I think because of that, I'd like to think that the, that the plot feels more organic. Uh, I don't think it's necessary to write like that. It just felt like I, I had to write it this way. It was also my first time writing a novel, so I was absolutely terrified. And it, it's by far the most difficult thing I've ever done. And part of it was the not knowing. Not knowing where I was going. Kind of, it's kind of like a, a, a person fumbling in the darkness of a room, trying to avoid furniture, and not knowing where you are at all. Uh, that's how I felt most of the time. It's a horrible experience. <laughs> yes? Um, Maybe not so different. Um, I'm curious about the experience of writing passages like the ones that you read. That kind of, the, at least as the, the listener or reader, they sit on the heart. They're they're heavy and um, you know hard to experience the empathy. For, I mean, experience empathy for, but it's a difficult emotion. You know, yeah, it's sad. It's heart wrenching. Um, for you as a writer, I'm, I'm wondering about that experience. If it um, if there's a catharsis to it, if you end up needing some sort of therapy after <laughs> uh, You know, I haven't actually been asked that question. Um, I think, I don't know, maybe I have a dark heart. <laughs> but it, I mean, it affects me in the sense that, um, I mean, at least in those passages, um, it makes me think, see, I, I went through that. I, I escaped Vietnam in a boat like that with my mother and my, my, my seven-year-old sister. I was almost five at the time. So I have no memory of it. But I, 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 I often suspect that the emotional, I guess, the shadow of those emotions have always kind of stuck with me. Um, I always suspect that. I don't know if I'm imagining it. So I think when I was writing that, those passages, it, it, I did feel them more acutely than other things that I've written, because it feels like I'm I'm finally mapping out things that I've forgotten, mm -hmm. that are kind of you know those those early memories that you can never really truly reclaim, and again, but the shadow of it always lives with you, you know. Um, so I felt that, but I think more importantly, I I you know I was more concerned with the mother's voice, you know, um, and I think the, it's less about what happens that affects me, it's more the voice. Uh, and I found her voice fairly quickly, you know. And the interesting thing was I, the, you know, I had a lot of books on my desk while I was writing, and, and, you know, a good number of them were crime novels. But I had a lot of, like, literary novels, too. And one of them that I, I constantly opened was, was Marilyn Robinson's Gilead, which I'm sure some of you may know that is, you know, the entire novel is, you know, the 70-year-old minister who's writing a letter to his his baby, his young son, uh, his infant son, who he knows he will not see grow up. And I think the humanity in that voice and the kind of, you know, working out of both uh, a spiritual, philosophical, religious, uh, and even the physical, um, <laughs> sitting through his past and working out those things for himself, and in a sense working it out for his son on some level, is what I gravitated towards and I kind of like I would just open up random pages and just kind of like breathe in her voice and try to like you know breathe it on onto some, into my book because I wanted that sense of humanity and regret but also confusion like how do I explain something like this to someone to my child especially a child I don't really know you know uh, so that voice to answer your question, it was more or less about the events, but more about the voice that I guess I carried with me throughout mm -hmm. writing the book. Yes? Was she a teacher of yours when you were in Iowa, and did she did you take any classes with her? Yeah, I, I did. Um, uh, I took a Moby Dick class with her, a uh, seminar with her, and I took her workshop. Uh, 
I admired her writing uh, more than anyone there and the faculty there. I don't, I didn't find myself learning that much from her, <laughs> but only because I was at the end of it and I was tired of the workshop. <laughs> uh, but I found what was interesting about her and is that even when I disagree with her, I, I, um, I find her very interesting. For example, she uh, is not a fan of Flannery O'Connor. That's one thing I, I always remember her not being a fan of Flannery O'Connor precisely because O'Connor was cruel to her characters. And I found that interesting because I'm rather cruel to my characters. And I don't know if, she, if Marilyn would approve. Um, but there's a lot there that, that I think about um, in, in many different ways. Uh, but yeah, she's, yeah. She always talks about this. Yes. Yeah, I'm just curious about the uh, your, the, the mother of the son commits suicide because her son is missing and she has nothing else to live for, she thinks. And then her son is found. Mm -hmm. Why did you do that? <laughs> well, to be arbitrarily cruel. Cool. <laughs> um, like, were you trying to reflect the cruelty of the world? Or was there... Well, I mean, I... I wanted... I, I think the boy being found was not... It, it obviously wasn't just to be cruel to her and to kind of point out the ironic cruelty of life. But, I mean, though that is partly it. I think it was more to, I think, in my mind, the fact that the boy is actually found is an irony that, that you know, emphasizes the reasons why she killed herself. And in my mind, the reasons why she killed herself was that, and it's, it's all, I mean, I was juxtaposing it with the narrator, the mother, who is contemplating uh, all the reasons why she doesn't want to be a mother, why she is uncomfortable in this role that has, in a sense, been thrust on her. And, and so my interest was in uh, the roles that we are obligated to play, whether we want them or not, especially in a society like, like Asian, uh, or I could, I'll just speak for, for Vietnamese culture. So I want to kind of juxtapose that, a narrator who was uncomfortable and did not want her role as a mother, and another mother who can only think of herself or define herself in that role as a mother. And with a person like that, when you take that role away, how else can you define yourself? And what does that mean to, you know, uh, your sense of yourself as a human? Um, or your motivation? I mean, what are you doing? I, you know, the thing that my mother always told me was that I was doing this for you guys. So, and I believe her. And if you take away that reason, then really, what is there to live for? And I, I found that motivation interesting, and I wanted to see what would happen if the mother who doesn't want that role at all is confronted with a woman who is killing herself because she has lost that, that reason to live. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes? Um, I'm wondering why you chose to write a narrated portion from the perspective of a woman. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, you mentioned that that's not very common in crime novels. A woman mm -hmm. just kind of disappears, but she's just more of a figure there. Do you feel in some sense you're able to tell like some of your mother's story from this? Or do you feel like this is an unexplored like character in mm -hmm. that type of genre? Well, you know, like I said, you know, the, 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 the role of the detective, you know, at least for a long time, it's traditionally a male role. And it, it, it descended from that idea of the Baronic hero, the, the male, uh, uh, very masculine. It, it felt like a very, um, not just a masculine role, but a masculine emotions. And obviously that's not true, you know. And I thought it'd be interesting to have, I mean, the, the wife, a police officer, who is the, the hero of the, you know, the crime novel, uh, fits that role. But I thought it would be interesting to also have a female play that role as well in the letters. But the other thing too is that, you know, I think the, the, the figure that we're always familiar with is the femme fatale in, in noir fiction. And, and the femme fatale, uh, I think, uh, has agency only in negative terms, if that makes sense, and also rarely has a very loud voice. Um, so her, her role is usually a way to, to kind of uh, emphasize the, the hero's uh, uh, you know, a personality. 
uh, to be um, a source of, of um, uh, what's the word, um, uh, a source of moral, moral ambiguity, the seductious. Uh, and again, she rarely has uh, a voice. So I thought it'd be interesting to give her a voice and, and to make her more than just you know uh, an object of affection. Um, and and um, hopefully, I, I, I mean, I'm not the first to do that, but I do think that, that those voices uh, are generally not, not seen because it just doesn't fit that, that female figure that we see often in, in noir fiction. It's not as sexy, I guess, because it's less mysterious when you have a voice. You know? Yes? Um, I was thinking earlier about um, your inquiry about why some people don't tell their, story, their stories of their refugee stories, yeah. mm-hmm. um, even if they wanted to. And when you were reading, it struck me, it just struck me as like a, a narrative trauma. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering, after you wrote that this novel, um, did you come closer to answering um, that question for yourself? I don't know the question to you. My yeah. second question is really simpler. Like, what's the significance of the title? Oh, okay. okay. Um, that's a good question. I mean, I, I think... Did I, did I remember your question? No. Oh. You just that. Oh, yeah. So, so she was asking whether, you know... Um, I suddenly blanked because I was thinking of the, the answer to the title <laughs> thing. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, uh, hey, can you repeat the question again? Sure, sure. Um, <coughs> he, he was saying earlier that he was wondering why some people can't can't tell their stories of, of their, their refugee stories even, even if they wanted to. Mm-hmm. And I was asking, in writing this novel, did you come closer to answering that question? Yeah. Well, I think generally when when you hear about immigrants who don't want to, and I hear this all the time, you know. Uh, Friends of mine who are Vietnamese, and my parents never talk about that, um, about that time in their life. Or, or you hear about uh, people whose uh, parents were uh, Vietnam veterans here, and they didn't want to talk about that time. And usually the, the suggestion or the, uh, the assumption is that that experience was too traumatic to talk about, mm-hmm. something that they would rather forget and not talk about. And that is obviously true. I think the thing I'm beginning to understand more is that oftentimes, and for immigrants, I think, it's not only because of trauma, it's that they now find themselves um, in a different world where that narrative doesn't quite fit, if that makes sense. Um, that, that if you, for example, you transition from uh, a society that, for example, where the, the familial roles and obligations are, are really, I mean, they're, they're foremost to a, a society where uh, the individual is privileged over the collective. I think when you find yourself transitioning to that very, very different culture, some of your stories, you don't quite know how to tell them anymore. You know? Like, yeah, this story about um, a mother losing her child, I think, would resonate in any culture. Uh, not my novel, but like just that narrative. But it, it feels a little different when you don't have the context of how important, mm-hmm. you know, uh, obligations are and familial roles are, uh, but also gender roles as well, right? It plays a little differently. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah, I think it's, you know, you just feel this kind of, uh, yeah, I, I, whether it's conscious or not, you're not sure if your narrative is one that, that will be understood, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and I think that's one reason why uh, people don't uh, talk about it. Um, and, there are, and there are others too, but that's the one that I've, I've been thinking about more. Uh, as for the title, the title is Dragonfish, and, and originally I, uh, the title of the short story was This or Any Desert. And I, that was the title of the novel uh, the whole time, and that's what the title I wanted. And it's more literary title, I guess. Um, but then my editor uh, was editing it, and she emailed me and said, uh, "How about you think of another title?" <laughs> <laughs> and, and she was very, you know, uh, very, you know, she wasn't saying that she didn't like it. She said, "Think of, think of something else." And I couldn't because I'm horrible at titles. So she, she, it was her idea to call it Dragonfish. 
Uh, and it comes from uh, uh, something in the second chapter. Uh, the new Vietnamese husband is a, a smuggler of illegal fish. And there's a, a, a fish called the Asian arowana. Um, and, and some of them, especially the gold one, are, are smuggled here. And they can go for like $10,000. And, uh, yeah. To eat or? Excuse me? To eat? Claire? It's a fish that you eat or it's a fish? No, no, a fish, uh, it's, a, it's a pet, you know. Yeah, and um, and she thought it sounded good. I didn't like it because I got another book about Asians with the word dragon in it. I, like, <laughs> I also told them, you know, uh, no red or yellow on my cover. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't have the, the cover here. I, I took the, the sleeve off, but it, it's, it's very red and yellow. But it stands out <laughs> here. You know, you realize you got to pick your battles, and 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 they want to market it a certain way. But but so what I did was I went back and to that chapter, and I added a few things because that's the only time dragonfish shows up. But the thing is that dragonfish, uh, uh, you know, Asians believe that it uh, brings the family together, that it uh, brings good luck, and it wards away evil. And I kind of like the irony that it does none of those things in the book. Um, so, so I, I think I like it more now. Because um, usually when I, I, I say this or any desert, people have to ask me to repeat myself. So maybe it's a good thing. You know. I don't know. I just let them take care of it. I have no control over it. <laughs> <laughs> We're about out of time, actually. And I think that, that leaves us on a little note of mystery. <laughs> you can find out what does or doesn't happen in the book. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me.